This is the To Health With That, Naturally Healthy in No Time podcast for big health topics taken in small bites. I'm your host, naturopathic doctor Amy Nuzel, and this is season one, all about the MTHFR mutation. This week, let's talk about MTHFR and estrogen. Why are these linked? There's no obvious link between the two. They seem to be in unrelated fields of the body, affecting entirely different spheres. Sadly, that is not true. While it's true that the MTHFR gene is not involved in estrogen metabolism directly, it's also true that the products of the gene are. So in the end, does MTHFR end up in bed with estrogen? Yes. Yes, it does. It's another detox issue. The word detox, when you have an MTHFR issue, starts to trigger a nervous eye twitch pretty quickly. You just know there's a catch or some little loophole that you're going to fall into and spend months crawling out of. Estrogen detox is no exception. But first, estrogen is a useful substance. It's called the Marilyn Monroe hormone, and that sounds amazing. More on that in a minute. So why do we even need to detoxify it? Estrogen is a highly useful hormone for both men and women, although women have it in much larger quantities. Estrogen helps boost sex drive, thicken bones, protect your heart from cardiovascular disease, and decrease anxiety. It's responsible for the majority of female sex characteristics, like breast growth, and without it, there would be no fertility, so why get rid of it? Hormones are short-term messengers. They're meant to send their signal and then go away. Hormone levels fluctuate day by day, And in order for a hormone level to change, you have to be able to get rid of it, plain and simple. Remember we talked about phase one and phase two detoxification reactions last week. Estrogen goes through both of those. Just to be clear, there isn't one thing in the body called estrogen. Just like folate, there are many forms of estrogen, some better and some worse. These forms interconvert in various ways and affect tissues differently. On the website to healthwiththat.com, I'll show you a diagram of how the estrogens interconvert and how they're actually eliminated from the body, but uh, it's very difficult to do visuals on a podcast, so you'll just have to take my word for it here. So I added some red X's on this diagram where MTHFR folks get stuck. There's hitches galore. The methylation cycle is plopped smack in the middle of estrogen metabolism because we methylate some of the metabolites in phase two into their less harmful forms in order to excrete them. If you can't methylate at that particular moment, then your body has no choice but to convert some estrogens to quinones, the worst possible pathway. With the quinones, we can use glutathione to help eliminate them, but glutathione, if you'll recall, can be a bit shaky in MTHFR folks, so that's not so good. And if we can't neutralize those quinones, then they have potentially carcinogenic effects, which means they have the potential to actually increase your risks for cancer. Now, not all estrogen is created equal. Different types of estrogen have different relative impacts on body tissues, or different strengths, so to speak. So here's the breakdown. Estradiol, which is uh, abbreviated to E2, is one and a half to five times more active in the tissues than estrone, or E1. These two forms of estrogen can interconvert freely. In terms of estrogen metabolites, 2-hydroxyestrone helps modulate the activity of more biologically active estrogens and has been shown to decrease the risk of breast cancer. 4 and 16-hydroxyestrogens, however, are more biologically active and also more carcinogenic, meaning they have the potential to promote cancer. So what does this mean for you? The bottom line in all of this is that without good methylation in phase 2 detoxification, Estrogens are oxidized and converted to quinones, which have potential carcinogenic effects. These effects can be mitigated by glutathione, but with MTHFR issues, you also have the potential to be short on that. So, MTHFR mutants end up being prone to something called estrogen dominance. Estrogen dominance means that your estrogen levels are, relatively speaking, higher than the levels of other hormones. It doesn't mean that they are too high, quote-unquote, on a lab test, it just means that the ratio between estrogen and progesterone in women or estrogen and testosterone in men is out of balance. 
If you have estrogen dominance, you may have a number of signs and symptoms. For women, that could be fibrocystic breasts or uterine fibroids, PCOS or endometriosis, heavy bleeding, clotting, and cramping with your periods, irregular periods or infertility, and fatigue, depression, or anxiety. In men, it could be gynecomastia, which is man boobs, loss of muscle mass and a more typically female fat distribution, sexual dysfunction, and also fatigue, depression, and anxiety. So what do you do about this thing, this estrogen dominance? Well, my favorite is eat your veggies. Cruciferous vegetables from the family of brassica species, that includes like broccoli, cauliflower, kale, Brussels sprouts, and cabbage, help to shift your metabolic pathways away from the cancer-promoting 16 hydroxy metabolites. It also helps to reduce the symptoms of estrogen dominance by shifting from high-activity forms of estrogen to lower-activity forms. You can also eat your fiber. You are an inherently thrifty creature, and even after your body eliminates something into your gut, you often go back and sort through the trash and pick out things that might be useful. If you have a good amount of fiber in your system, then lots of toxins, like hormone waste, bind to that fiber, so you can't go back and pick it up again. You can also eat your lignans. Lignans, which are found especially in flax seeds, but to a lesser degree in sesame seeds, are estrogen modulators. They help to balance excess estrogens and are the foundation for a gentle form of hormone balancing in women called seed cycling. It's way too much to get into here, but there's a great link to a complete seed cycling article on the website. You can supplement with N-acetylcysteine, or NAC for short. NAC is readily available supplement that acts along with selenium as a precursor to glutathione production. This works even for MTHFR folks. And if you boost that glutathione, you can get rid of those quinones. You can also, and this is a huge one, eliminate estrogen mimetics. There are lots of environmental toxins that mimic estrogen in your body. So outside of your own estrogen, which might be high, you might also have all of these other chemicals floating around, binding to estrogen receptors and causing havoc. These include things like phthalates and parabens, Phthalates is a weird word. It's spelled P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S. And those are found in things like lotion, perfume, synthetic air fresheners, and body wash. The name of the actual chemical compound will be long, but the word phthalate, P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E, or paraben, will be in there somewhere. Also, BPA and its related chemicals from plastics, which help make soft plastic soft, so don't ever microwave your food in plastic. Also, plasticizers in soft plastics, which can be used in the household, but also especially um, construction sites like uh, caulking is almost entirely soft plasticizers. So what about MTHFR and other hormones? Does it get messed up there, too? Great question. There's no known link between MTHFR and testosterone, but high estrogen can lead to low effective testosterone through the backdoor method of sex hormone binding globulin. SHBH, sex hormone binding globulin, rises when estrogen levels become too high in order to bind to and therefore inactivate some of the excess estrogens. Unfortunately, SHBH prefers testosterone, so it binds to that more frequently, thereby inactivating that as well. So high estrogen levels often lead to lower levels of free testosterone, which is the active form. Also, stress hormones in MTHFR have not really been studied, but there may be a link. A paper published in 2017 from the Nurses Study showed that MTHFR polymorphisms affect perceived occupational stress levels. The study didn't actually test levels of cortisol, which is the major stress hormone, but it did show that people who have homozygous C677T, and that's two bad copies, perceived higher stress levels than their heterozygous or wild-type peers. And again, heterozygous is one bad copy, wild-type is no bad copies. The heterozygous group did perceive a higher stress level than the normal group, but the difference wasn't enough to be considered statistically significant. Perhaps in future studies, they'll look for the same information, but testing cortisol levels. Thanks so much for listening. We didn't get time to talk about the Marilyn Monroe hormone, but if you want to read about it, you can go to the complete show notes at tohealthwiththat.com. Next week, we'll talk about MTHFR and neurotransmitter formation because that's the basis for so many other topics, like why MTHFR intertwines with anxiety and depression. After that, we get into the good stuff, like why your multivitamin might actually be doing more harm than good. Thank you.